Welcome to Woodshop 101, a woodworking audio podcast geared toward the hobby weekend woodworker. Our hosts for the show are Jeremy Crawford and Drew Shore. Join these two different craftsmen for a lighthearted banter about everything in woodworking, online education, and how they produce content. Topics could include the latest news, tips, tricks, and designs to include furniture, crafts, and shop projects. Welcome to episode number 19 of Woodshop 101 podcast. Today we're going to talk about finishes and their application. We're also joined tonight by our guest host, Steve Ramsey of Mere Mortals, both home and garden and woodworking. Steve, how are you doing tonight? Hey guys, great to be here. Well, it's glad that you just accepted our invitation. Oh, sure. So, for uh, the people that don't know who you are, which is probably not very many, you want to just give a brief introduction about yourself? Sure. I've been, uh, I have a, my main channel on YouTube is Woodworking for Mere Mortals, where I focus on making woodworking projects that anybody can do with very little experience and not a whole lot of tools. All right. Well, yeah, if you don't know, Steve's pretty big into woodworking and he's on YouTube. So that's, uh, probably one of my favorite channels to watch every week. I, oh, I'm glad. pretty much like the mere minutes cause it gets pretty entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> so it gives me something to kind of lighten the mood. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I've got the second channel, my vlog channel, Mere Minutes, and once in a while people find me from that show, which is really weird because it must just seem completely out of context, this guy just talking about some woodworking stuff and some other things, and and then they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know you had a woodworking channel. Yeah, I can definitely see that. You're picking up on that one first. You're going to be a little lost. You have to... Figure, I, figure out where you're going. I, I love having that second channel. I think it's a blast. It's just because it, it's pretty easy for me to just, you know, just say what's on my mind. You know, I try to keep a couple of topics and it just is a way for me to connect with fans, you know, a lot better than just on the main channel because I'm mere minutes. It's kind of like the core group of people who watch my show. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like a big family over there, really. Yeah. And well, you, so, so like on, on, your main channel you kind of have to keep it to a certain degree of woodworking and you you know on a vlog channel you pretty much can just go in any direction you want and, right, exactly. and have no real outcome of it so yeah. yeah yeah i enjoy that i've been doing movie reviews the last two weeks <laughs> <laughs> woodworking so. and movies yeah yeah i've been actually this last time though i gave people a warning when i was doing i'm like okay the rest of this is just movie reviews so you know. oh, yeah and then you have the giant kitten pop up on and the that's screen right. i had a, I had a, a kitten <laughs> in a in a bed of marshmallows so you know they did like horror movie reviews they have their time to get out <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't generally i mean i've seen a lot of horror movies i generally don't watch them the older i get and <laughs> i mean i guess i really don't watch a whole lot of anything besides cartoons with kids floating around here but no, I'm a. I, I start hearing about like old, people suggesting older movies, and I'm like, wow, like that's you, you just don't think about those nowadays because you're starting to get all these crazy animated movies and and all these you know the 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 graphic violence and everything that comes with them, like the original Chainsaw Massacre. You know, mm-hmm. like, man, this is <laughs> so much better. <laughs> so, I still think my my favorite's The Shining. I, oh, that's that movie good still gives me the the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about old movies. My my wife and I not too long ago watched the uh, the Hitchcock movies, the the Birds. Remember that one? Oh, that's an awesome yeah. one. Yeah, that's yeah, that, t- that takes place up here, up in my neck of the woods. And know a lot of those locations, but that's a great film because there was no music in that. All of the soundtrack was just these weird electronic sounds of the birds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, how far are you from San Francisco? I'm right across the Golden Gate Bridge. Marin County is the you're first, north. Yeah, just north of San Francisco. Okay. So it's like a you know 15 minute drive. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you guys are probably going to be the first to hear in it, but I'm. I originally was planning on moving to Dallas here in, uh, in the next few months. And it looks like I'm actually going to be staying in the Coast Guard a little longer than what I planned. And I am going to be moving um, next summer. And I've actually 
requested to be going to San Fran. So, wow, the Coast Guard. There's a Coast Guard right across the freeway from where I live in Hamilton. Yeah. So oh, maybe that's where you would end up. Then. I'll be. Is that- um, I'd be the base that I put in for was Alameda. Oh, okay. So out in the East Bay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish. Um, Petaluma was open because I've spent some time up there and mm. I, I love the country. And so being up there is just great for me, mm-hmm. but that, that was not an open job to pick from. So I'm shocked, <laughs> Jeremy. I'm what? shocked. What do you think? I'm going to go to Oklahoma. There's, not, there's no <laughs> coast guard in Oklahoma. I got some beachfront property you'd be interested in. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> as long as you're going to pay me what the coast guard pays me, I'll come work your beachfront property. Yeah. I didn't say it was by a, a ocean, <laughs> maybe a pond. We'll see. I mean, one of our small boats would fit there, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, I, in fact, it's been a pretty stressful time um, because I don't just get to pick out of one job. I had seventy jobs to pick from, and I had to put a list of probably about the first top twenty jobs I wanted. Um, and my first pick would obviously stay here in Texas because that's where I'm from. But there wasn't only but one job to choose from here in Texas. And so it was pretty stressful about where where I was planning on moving in. Because there, I, I kind of picked all over the world, all over the globe. Some in Alaska, California, Georgia, Florida, Texas, so Washington. So I'm... So at some point next year, I will probably be on a coast somewhere and probably not the Gulf Coast. <laughs> so, all right. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. Well, you know, hopefully if I get out there in the Bay Area, I'll be seeing more of Steve. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. Stop by. So, all right. Well, I'd like to remind you guys, if you listen to the show on iTunes, go ahead and head over there. Give us a five-star rating. It helps us reach greater audience and kind of gives us some more listeners. Um, and that's what we're here for. We obviously want to grow the channel um, and, and the podcast as much as we can and, and reach as many people. So let's uh, let's get into what's going on in you guys' shops. Steve, you got anything going on or anything that you want to share that, that's going on in your shop? I, I always have stuff going on. This week I made a, uh, a coffee maker, actually. It's this, a drip coffee maker. I didn't know this was a thing. And then I discovered that you can make these coffee makers where it's just you're kind of brewing coffee one cup at a time. And it's just basically a system to drip coffee. So I, I had to do something kind of a uh, little bit quicker and easier than I even normally do because I had this huge plumbing disaster out in, in my in my drain this week. And so the first three days of the week, they were out there just busting up concrete and working with very loud machines. And a lot of the work I do for the show, I like to work out in my driveway. And so it was completely off limits. And I had to keep the garage door shut, which I don't hardly ever do. So it was just a little bit different way for me to make a video this week. But it all came out. And the actual drip coffee maker thing is kind of cool. You know, I, I feel like a real kind of a Starbucks hipster or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, for, for I guess for those coffee snobs out there, they'll like that. That's exactly I, I just, what just, it is. Just it's give me, thing. just give me a, a, a black cup of coffee, a little sugar. <laughs> I'll be all right. <laughs> well, that's why I even made a, a mention of that in the video that I tested it, and I tasted it, and but I'm not really sure if I can tell the difference between that and then coffee brewed just in by coffee Look, maker. I don't know. No, so I, dr- I mean I drink coffee every day, and I can't. I mean I, I can tell you when it's burnt. But I can't, other than that, I can't tell you what kind of pot it came out of. So, well, see, but, make your own drip coffee maker, and then you, you can determine for yourself if there's a big difference. Well, there you go, Jeremy. Another project to put on the table. Well, oh man, y'all, y'all need to stop the projects because they're never ending. And I've actually been busy, and there's still a never ending list. Do you do you keep multiple projects going at the same time? I try not to because I'm very OCD, but mm. somehow I just. I, my, my work schedule fluctuates so much that it's hard to get one project done, especially on a larger project. Um, 
It's sure, hard yeah. to get it done if it's not already a commission. If it's a commission, that's no problem. I'll, I'll get it knocked out. But, you know, i got a couple tables in my shop and and then a bunch of smaller projects. And those are just like kind of fill-ins. Like when I don't have something else going on, I'll mm-hmm. work on those. And, yeah, I, I don't like having multiple projects. But I Yeah, I, I hear you. I don't like that. It's a, Just to even look at it, it's like a constant reminder that you're not getting it done. You yeah, know? Exactly. <laughs> like I walk out there and I got a dining room table base already built out there and I just see it and I'm like, well, it's a good lumber storage. It's stack lumber there. Turn around and there's that that, that sofa table that just somehow doesn't ever get done. Right. And what it does is it makes you feel guilty about any free time you have. If you come out to the shop and you think, oh, I'm kind of some free time. Oh, I got that thing to deal with. And so <laughs> you, can't, you can't just go yeah. and relax. You and know, it's always on your mind. Exactly. And now I'm at the point that I'm like, all right, well, I want to get those done. And at least the sofa table and get me a, another little footprint back in my shop. But then I look over it at my assembly table and it's covered with – uh, pin blanks for turning pens and and pizza pills stuff and you know a bunch of other items. I'm like, all right, well, I gotta I, I gotta finish that stuff first, and then I can go to the sofa table because I it, if I just pick that stuff up and move it somewhere else in the shop, it'll never get done. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, and that's what I've been really trying to get done now is now um within the next two weeks, I want to before I start on my Christmas. Um, commissions that that I have coming in, I want to get um, all just the miscellaneous stuff done. And I've been turning a bunch of pens um, because I got I bought probably thirty kits a year ago to kind of put together and and just sell here or there. And I finally started making them. Now I need to finish those and finish some pizza pills. Um, and that are sitting on on the bench, and then hopefully, hopefully that sofa table will be done there, Drew. <laughs> where, not, where do you find your commissions? Where do you get commissions from? Uh, it really started word of mouth. I don't do a lot of advertising. Mm-hmm. Um, it I when I moved here almost four years ago, I found a lady that was she she I don't even remember how I found her, um, but she had bought all this lumber because her dad told her she could build a, um, she, she could build a farmhouse table. And I guess her and her husband got so overwhelmed and they were trying to do it. I wouldn't say the correct way, but they were trying, they were trying to do it a way that I would have never dreamed of and do it with a lot of angle, uh, little angle brackets and, Mm. something that was not very sturdy. And so I just, you know, I told her, I, I, you know, I make furniture and, you know, I, I can help you out or whatever. And she was like, Oh, well, look, I just got all this lumber. What can you do? And I was like, Hey, look, I'll, I'll, I'll labor 300 bucks. I'll, I'll get it knocked out for you. Well, we finally settled on this size and I took the lumber she had and made the table with not using angle bracket stuff using, I think a, I put that one together, I think with some pocket hole screws and she gets it. She puts it in her house. Two weeks later, she gives me a call. I, I need another table. Okay. What happened to the table? I just built you. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's not the size that I want. It's a little too narrow, a little too long. So I need another one. So, okay. She's like, but I don't know what to do with this one. So list it on Craigslist you'll easily get your 300 out of it. You know, yeah. listed for about 500 bucks. And I think she ended up getting somewhere around four or 450 for it. And lo and behold, she turned around, she ordered a whole nother dining room table. Mm-hmm. And somebody that wanted to buy that first dining room table from her, she had already sold, but she gave them my contact information. So then that lady contacted me and had me build an outdoor table for her and before I even got that one delivered to her, she had a piece of granite that she brought to me and said, hey, I want a coffee table out of this too. So I was like, all right, well, dang. So just word of mouth just started trickling in and and not, I guess, being shy to talk about woodworking or mention it that I, that I do that. And then 
people are just like, oh, really? Can you take a look at this for me? Oh, you give me a price on this. And it has done fairly well for me. I wouldn't say I could definitely make a living on it right now, um, mainly because I don't put that much effort in to try to market myself. Do you, but, do you find that in, uh, people have a hard time – be, being willing to pay what really makes sense to charge. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, yeah. and, and I look at it and, and the first lady that I built the first few tables for, I've done a lot, a lot of work for her. Um, and there's some things that she looks at and she's, she looks at it on Pinterest and she's thinking, Oh, like 150 or 200 bucks. And I drop mm-hmm. a price of 450 to 500 on her for a basic, like little fold down desk. And she's like, well, that's not what I was thinking. Well, I mean, look, this is how many hours it's going to take me to work on it. This is how much the material is going to cost. You know, I, right. I do a very, I, I do a breakdown of like, all right, here's your, here's your materials. That's what it's going to cost. This is what I charge per hour. This is how many hours it's going to take me. And I generally shoot under what I what actually think it will take me. So if I think it's going to take me 30 hours, I'll be like, all right. 25 and and then i'll play it for so the next time i'll know okay it actually took me 30 hours then i'll know to charge that and a lot of times you know i've had i've had several people be like oh wait wait that's way too much but i think in general crafts people do a poor job of educating the public on how valuable the services the people who make things by hand uh how valuable those services are and how they should be paid. And I think it's just a matter of education that the general population and general public was used to shopping at, at, uh, you know, big box retailers and, and, and Walmart and Ikea and getting the furniture there, which is real inexpensive compared to what custom handmade furniture is. They don't really have any idea how much labor and how much thought and, design goes into a custom piece and for you know to come to somebody with a dresser somebody wants to say a dresser built and and you can run the numbers get the materials and say okay this dresser is going to cost five thousand dollars and they'll they look at you and think you've got to be kidding me i can go to i can go to macy's and pick up one for eight hundred dollars or you know so it's really uh, it's really a matter of perception, but I think it's one of the biggest issues that the whole community really needs to work on. And community, I mean craftspeople and makers and woodworkers and anybody who's making things and trying to sell them on a commission really needs to get this out better and do a better job of convincing people because you break it down and, you know, it, a lot of times – you end up, even though your customer may think it's expensive, you break it down and you're ending up, you know, making less than minimum wage for the amount of time it takes to build these things. Oh, uh, absolutely. You know, and I, uh, I'm in a, a, uh, wood turning Facebook group and just uh, yesterday, maybe a uh, gentleman posted a picture of a box of, or, or like a, a, a can of um, rose Missouri rosewood turned pens, and they were saying they, they put custom. Let's just see on the sign. It was a custom, custom pen, three dollars each. Missouri wow. rosewood, and that's the, like the exact same kit that you can buy that wood turners and pen makers are, are selling for thirty five, forty, or forty five dollars. Mm. And that just like undervalues what what we do, but you know, yeah, that is that's a bad situation right there because yeah. just kind of your like almost your your own worst enemy there. People doing that kind of yeah. thing. yeah, and and what people also don't realize is like so you're looking at a box full of probably 500 pins there. There's a good chance they're all the exact same, and that's probably because they have an automated lathe mm-hmm. that's turning them out and. So you don't physically have somebody standing there hovering over it that, and, and spending 30 or 45 minutes turning that pin and finishing it by hand and assembling it by hand. And, right. you know, so when you start talking $3, I mean, 
you're not charging labor for anything but a machine. And it, I, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions. And like, and like you said, you know, they, the, the consumer will go to a store and be like, I'll buy that dresser for 800 bucks. Well, let's do a comparison on materials here. You're looking at a piece of a laminated press wood or, or, or MDF versus solid wood. And if you go to a furniture store that sells solid wood furniture, you're going to see that price difference between Ikea and we have a place here called Gallery Furniture that sells nothing but American-made solid wood furniture. And that stuff is still expensive. You know, granted that something coming out of my shop is still going to be a little more expensive because I'm not mass producing it. Right. It just the material difference alone. And Mm -hmm. I, I don't think consumers really understand that. Um, They they don't. And I I think this is how pretty it is. One question I get asked a lot is, you know, how do I make a living, you know, doing woodworking? And I always just tell people, you know, I don't know because I don't make a living doing woodworking at all. If I did, I would starve. You know, I make a living making videos. Yeah. But the the only viable way to do it, I think, is to find high end customers, clientele who are willing to spend ten thousand dollars on a single piece of furniture who who want that one-on-one partnership with the craftsman and the creator the designer to all you know to feel that what they're getting none of their friends have it's a one of a kind creation yeah but and- but wow as far as, as making uh, individual things for most people they don't want to pay or they just you can't afford it really i mean there's yeah. there's there's no way around that uh, but i do think it's kind of viable to like when you were talking about turning pens i think that that's a pretty viable way i don't know if you can make a living doing that kind of thing but if you can find something that is really uh, you could you know mass produce yourself so to speak even though each one is custom made you know something with low cost of materials that you can batch out you know, I've certainly seen a lot of people make a fair amount of money doing that, and if nothing else, maybe enough money to buy yourself some new tools. Yeah, I I do know. I don't, and I and I can't say that it's probably a good alternative or good option for many people. But there's two people here in the state of Texas that make a living and make a a great living off of just pens, selling pens. Yeah. One guy makes three hundred thousand dollars. That's the second highest paid in the state of Texas. The first guy makes $600,000 just turning pens, but they spend more time marketing themselves than they do right. selling those pens. These guys, and, and in fact, I, I the only reason I know it is because he was in our local woodcraft selling um, pen blanks and stuff because they make, like, they'll, they'll cast their own pen blanks or, or they'll do, like, crazy stuff like snake skin and, he uh he was telling me about it and he was like I mean we're we spend ninety percent of our time going around to gun shops and all these different stores getting getting displays put up in their stores and that's how they sell them they don't personally sell those that though those pins to make that three hundred thousand dollars they're getting their their product in a store somewhere that's selling it for them right so. Anyway, all right. Well, well, Drew, what's going on in your shop? I think we lost Drew. Nope, I'm here. <laughs> oh well, just ignore <laughs> us. Had, Thanks. I had my mic on mute because I was moving around a little bit. <laughs> um, the uh, stuff going on in my shop. I just finished off my uh, clamp rack uh, build not too long ago, and I'm about ready to get started on uh, uh, an entire back wall of my shop, making cabinets with uh, all kinds of storage solutions inside of them about time i'm, I'm all about the storage solutions here lately yeah the things you, your ideas that you come up with for storage solutions really are amazing i love seeing your, the clamp rack was really awesome and of course your table saw cabinet all of that yeah that table saw cabinet was a uh, a, a big hit mainly thanks to you jay and john for kind of sharing it around but and thank and thank you for that again but uh i i i don't like 
things being on the ground, and I don't like them in cabinets where I've got to squat down and reach way back up inside. And right. I, I just cannot stand that. I'm all about drawers. I love drawers. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I've, I've never seen a clamp rack like that done before, and I, I was trying to maximize as much of my wall space as I could because most clamp racks, they just go from one end of the wall to the other, and you can only hang a certain amount of clamps. And uh, I had already outgrown the one that I had, so I was trying to figure out how to shrink the footprint but also uh, double the amount of clamps that I could stick in there. And uh, I I'd probably worked on that design for about a week trying to figure that out. Wow. Would you hate me, Drew, if I said I haven't seen that video yet? Yes, I would. Okay. <laughs> then, then I've seen it. I, uh, in, in fact, I, I have... Uh, a queue of a lot of videos to catch up on in yours is the ne- is the next up on on the viewing list i just this week at work i feel like i've been pulled in three different directions and literally i've been pulled in three different directions this week and so when i'm like i sit down at night i'm like all right i'm, I'm gonna start watching a video and then i find myself waking up and i'm like huh i don't remember what that video was about I mean, let me rewind that or put it back in my watch list because it's uh, not going to get played. Like Highland Woodworking, man, that's another one. I I, I want to see episode 20 that came out it's still on that watch list because I just can't find the time to sit down and watch it. You're just going to have to so, do it at work. Okay. When, when we get off of here, Drew, I'll sit down <laughs> and watch your video. Oh, you promise? I promise. Oh, okay. Really, really? I'll even I'll – even, uh, I would say tweet a picture, but I don't know how to do that. I'll, I'll Facebook a picture of me <laughs> That's watching. Right. You're not it. a tweeter. I mean, technically I am because Facebook does it for me, <laughs> but I don't manually do it. So Steve's a big Twitter person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like Twitter. I like it a lot better than Facebook. Although I, I use Facebook a lot, you know, but it's uh, Facebook has just gotten so horrible in the way it. Uh, <laughs> The way it treats everybody, it's just nasty. And every video on there is just a stolen YouTube video. It just drives me crazy. Mm-hmm. I, I think one of the biggest things that's driving me crazy right now about Facebook is, ex- especially on mobile app, I don't hardly ever get on the computer for anything anymore. And I I scroll down about two or three posts past my friends or people I'm trying to follow or something, and then there's a huge line of suggested people you should know, suggested mm-hmm. people that you probably know. And then, oh, suggested ads to look at. And I'm just like, so, t- like, I, get, I, if I wanted to know those people, I would. Get them off there. I don't want to see those. <laughs> I want to see the content from the people. And and, and the I think if the you're biggest lucky, you If you're lucky, you get to see some of that content. Yeah. That's, and, that's really the most frustrating thing on how it throttles back. Yeah. What you can see. It doesn't even give you the option. Because I would really just like the option. Yeah, show it all to me, you know. Let me sift through it. Sure, it might be a lot of stuff, but I can I, I can deal with that. Oh, yeah. then, you know, I'll post something to my Facebook page. I've got, I don't know, like 100, 120, 125,000 people on there. And, you know, a typical post I do will reach maybe eight, 10,000 of those people. That's just really frustrating. You know, mm-hmm. that it's really hard to get the message out to people on yeah. Facebook. And, and I don't know, it's just overall Facebook has just gotten really sleazy about everything and the way they, now that you, now you don't even want to put a link in your main post or they also throttle it back. So what you do is you have to post something and then put the link to what you want people to look at in the first comment down below. Yeah. Yeah, and I've also noticed too that there have been several updates that they've done uh in the past year that it used to be you could see all of the uh like the the main feeds or, or the most popular feeds and then there was an option to select that was newest feeds. Right. And now they're to the point where you could see a feed and and find something that you wanted to to see but maybe come back to later and when you go back it's not there anymore. You yeah. have a hard time finding it. Yeah. And and I don't yeah, I don't like how they really do control how like how you view the pages because say, you know, I view all the content from, you know, Rock and H Woodshop on Facebook. Well, if I don't constantly comment on that or visit your page, then 
you fall through the cracks and I don't see your content anymore. Yeah, and eventually it's, you won't see any of it. It's kind of a, it's a erosion, Facebook rot or something. There's actually a term for that where if you don't like or comment or share on a Facebook, any person posting on there, eventually you'll, you'll just see less and less where Facebook just stops you know, putting it in your feed. Yeah, and which is, doesn't make sense to me because you like that page or you've become friends with the person because you want to follow them. Right. And if for, for Facebook to decide that, oh, you don't need to follow that person anymore or you don't want to see that stuff, then how are you, how is an algorithm telling me that what I really don't want to see? You know, that, that makes yeah. sense to me. And you're just smarter so, than the computer. <laughs> no, look, I'm not smarter than the computer. That's why I got a smartphone. So, all right, well, let's uh, get into today, today's topic or tonight's topic. Um, I know we were talking about um, finishes and kind of like our go-to finish and, and how we want to apply it or how we like to apply it and why we go to that finish. Um, either one of you care to, to go first and, and tell us what? Well, I think it's no, no secret that I use spray lacquer on probably 90% of my projects. And the other 10% uh, is paint. <laughs> yeah, well, paint, I, I really think paint is a great finish, especially for outdoor projects. I think paint is a, probably the best way to keep something new outside. I yeah, think well, it, really any finish can keep it as good. It gives you very a lot of expression of your personality, too. Yeah. Um, you know, you apply a clear finish um, or one that slightly ambers the wood, it doesn't necessarily give you your personality, especially if you choose not to go with a higher um, priced exotic woods to match your personality. You know, I, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with painting. Yeah, there's certain projects you don't want to paint, but there's certain things that are great to paint. Yeah. I think you just look at each, each project individually and figure out what is best for that. What's the kind of mood that you want to get across and, you know, it's uh, kind of like toys, especially for little kids. I think kids really like bright colored toys. They like things that are painted. Even though we may appreciate the natural finish of wood, kids really don't care about that. So I think it's really fun to paint things bright colors for kids. But as far as regular clear finish, I go with lacquer just because it dries so quickly and I can apply you know, five or six coats in literally under an hour and then, uh, you know, sand it down real quickly, apply one more coat and it's done. Yeah. It, is there a certain reason why you go with rattle can lacquer versus um, maybe getting a cheap uh, HVLP system like the Airlex 5500? Yeah, I actually have one. I, a viewer sent me a, uh, sent me a whole setup but i just i haven't gotten around to using it yet i don't know it's just it's just easy for me to use the cans of lacquer i guess and it's just quick and i just grab one and, and go yeah uh, it's funny it's funny that you say that because back in i think it was back in may yeah it had to be because that's when we had mark spagnolo on the show mm-hmm. i actually won one of their fuji systems off his website that thing's still sitting in the box. <laughs> like, it's one of those projects that you kind of have to set aside. It's a project in itself to figure out, like, how to spray and how to properly clean the gun. Yeah, and I think that's the problem. There's, that's the cleaning and the maintenance. And um, I think if I was going to be doing large pieces and a lot of large pieces, I would probably take the time to set it all up and – I mean, you know, really get it going, but wow, just to clean it out after every time, just, I just have such a limited time to get my projects done each week. I just have to figure out the fastest way to do every, another finish I really like is Danish oil and it applies mm-hmm. really fast and easy. And if, if for getting kind of a really natural looking wood finish that's a way to go i love it it just gives you a kind of a real earthy feel about it you know whereas lacquer can sometimes look kind of plasticky yeah yeah i'm I'm right there with you on on that one i uh 
I had a go-to finish for a long time whenever I was doing craft shows and building custom furniture for people. I would always get that Formby's uh, tongue oil finish that had a poly blend in it. Right. And uh, it was just a really quick, easy wipe on and wipe off, and you can sand a couple between coats and about three or four coats into it, and it, it really deepens that wood and gives it a 3D effect. And uh, my wife loved it on her walnut furniture that I made for her. So that was one yeah. of my easy, quick grab-and-go finishes. Yeah, I love it. It's so easy to apply. You just could wipe it on. It's so forgiving, you know. Yeah. Uh, Drew, I mean, I, so, so you talked about you used to use this uh, tongue oil blend. Now, did, did you just buy blue and black paint by the truckload <laughs> hey the blue and black paint is mainly just for the shop furniture i i had a, a color color scheme established that when i made my shop furniture i was going to stick to it um but uh, i i've just recently bought a new uh gallon of black is, paint is, is that ocd coming out is it what is that ocd coming out <laughs> saying that, that it should be the same color uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you can't give me a hard time anymore about having the same color tools. Oh, dude, I've been doing this for how long? Probably t- almost two years, and you're just now getting on to me for it. <laughs> right, well, look, I only say it because I saw somewhere in the comments or something in one of your videos about this clamp cabinet that was like somebody said, "Oh, are you gonna paint it? Or it's too too bad you're gonna hide it under blue paint or something?" Yeah, <laughs> and I commented back and was like, "You betcha." <laughs> So yeah, uh, the the painting is mainly for my my shop projects. Just um, I, I like to bring color into the shop, and Steve could probably attest to this too. Cause yeah, it's, yeah, it's I think so. It's, it's yeah. really, I mean, shop projects and stuff for the shop doesn't really need any furniture or any finish at all. Really, I mean, you know, it, it's perfectly fine just to leave the bare wood because it's really not going to be exposed to the elements, and you don't have to keep it looking beautiful for people. So yeah, paint is a good way just to cheer the place up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, if your if your workplace is not an expression of your personality, then you're you're not going to have the drive, or in my opinion, not have the drive um, to want to do your best work. You know, if it's it's a place that's just very bland and doesn't reflect who you are, then you know you, when you go to build a project, you're probably not going to put as much heart and soul into it. Because you don't, you're you're in a place that you don't really feel like is your own. Yeah, and it for me it was also uh, with making videos. It, it having color in the background and bright walls really improves just the overall. It's easier to watch the video. And my early videos, my shop, I just had the uh, OSB. You know, boards which I painted over white, but they was just the natural OSB. And, and then everything in the shop was just wood colored and it was it's really hard to kind of get a sense of location and where things are in the shop when you're looking at it on video it just all looks like just wood color yeah <laughs> so I think having paint in there really improves the quality of the video a lot yeah and I kind of get excited just when I when I open up my garage doors now just coming home from work and I see you know my table saw cabinet my assembly table my clamp cabinet. And all of that stuff starting to match. And, That's pretty uh, cool, huh? I can see. Yeah, it is. I, I can see just a uh, picture in the back of my uh, shop, those cabinets that I'm wanting to start building now. And it's just it's just getting me geared up to get in the shop and just keep going. Cool. Yeah. So outside of paint, Drew, what, what do you like to use? Um, I am starting to, to draw to the, the lacquer finish, and uh, I've been using the rattle cans as well uh, for the smaller stuff. Now, I do have a, a three-stage Fuji sprayer that I actually acquired from uh, Lancer Blesky, who lives pretty close to me. Uh, he ended up getting an Erlex sprayer, so I bought his Fuji sprayer. And I, I haven't taken the time to get to know it. Uh, kind of like you said, it's, it's a project in itself. And whenever I learned how to spray paint out of my... Uh, Greco sprayer that I got from Lowe's, um, I actually took a board and, and set it out, kind of propped it up, and I just started practicing painting and playing with the the, the rate of uh, rate of feed for the paint and the air and everything. And 
uh, I, I'm wanting to, to get my Fuji system set up for just clear finishes, poly and lacquer and all that stuff. Um, but right right now, it's just the, the rattle can lacquer and um, latex paint from my shop, as well as the, the wipe-on tongue oil poly blends that uh, you can buy. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's going to be a trend is I ultimately fall back on rattle can lacquer. Um, just like Steve said, it's easy to apply. It's quick. You, you don't spend a mul- multiple days applying a finish. Um, you know, I that's my go-to finish. What do I really like to use? I like to do a hand-rubbed finish with... Um, Oh, what's it called? General finishes, um, armor seal. I really like to apply that in and, and do a hand rubbed finish on that to get a very natural feel on the wood, um, much like tongue oil does. And it, as much as I like that, you know, it's not practical to use on a lot of projects, um, especially those smaller ones when you're batching something out or, or you need. You need it to dry pretty quickly. Um, so, yeah, my go-to finish would have to be that spray can lacquer. In fact, I'm very particular, though. I um, use the uh, Deft. Is that, that that's the brand? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I use Deft. Like, a lot of people use Watco, and, and I think Valspar makes one. I'm very particular about using Deft. Um, I, I don't know why I've... Maybe it's because I've had great results with it, but I, I hope to, in the spring, go ahead and move into the HVLP system, um, but it, it comes down to you know, having that time and also having a place to shoot um, yeah. HVLP. You know, they <laughs> say it doesn't have a lot of overspray, but... When it comes it down to it, on, it depends on your your sprayer too, because yeah. my my Greco has a lot of overspray. Yeah, and and, and that's kind of where I'm at. Like I'm I don't have a place that like I would have to take my projects into the backyard into the corner in order to not get a lot of overspray on things. Um, and I can shoot rattle can right out front by my shop and not get any overspray on my vehicles. <laughs> um, and I'm afraid if an HVLP that that may not be the case. Um, so it's something I'll just have to play with and kind of see. But I, I fear at the point where I'm at in the shop that I'm at right now, HVLP just may not be in the future of it for the pure fact of being able to move a project to the location to shoot it is just not practical. You know, because then I got to have help to move it and. It just starts getting a whole lot more of a pain when I can just grab that rattle can and start shooting. I was about to say, when you get out to San Francisco and you get in a pinch, just take it to Steve's shop and he'll throw it on there for you. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) One thing that somebody had mentioned to me, and I I haven't got around to trying it, nor did I really know about it that much, is lacquer paint. Uh, Just because it has a a fast drying uh, time frame on it. I tried that on a recent project. It was the first time I'd ever tried it. I wanted a black lacquer paint. Um, and I didn't see any difference between that and just using regular spray paint, really. I couldn't really tell. You know, I was I was expecting it to be like those, you know, ultra high gloss black lacquer boxes that you see, you know, like yeah. in Chinatown or something. But it, no, it wasn't it didn't wasn't like that. What about the drying time? Was it just the same as, as spray paint? Yeah, dear as I could tell. I mean, spray paint dries so quickly. I, uh, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I just wasn't using it on the right project. I don't even remember what that project was now, but I still have half the can out in my shop. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, and the, and the thing about getting into like your more lacquer finishes or, or spraying through HVLP and buying it by the gallon is you can tint lacquer so like Mm. like you're saying you can make lacquer paint pretty much by mixing a tint into your lacquer um and a good example of that is is on uh, mark spagnolo's recent um woodworkers fighting cancer project is he actually tinted his lacquer white so it looked like he was spraying paint but it was actually spraying white tinted lacquer so 
I don't know about y'all. Are, have have y'all uh, experience with uh, shellac? I'm a little scared to start using shellac. I have a can of shellac. Um, I've only used it on one project. In fact, I've only used it on um, my turning mallet. That, that's all I've used it on. I, I've used it as a as a sealer, as a sealer coat before putting on other coats. But again, it's I think just for what I do, it's probably not worth the hassle. And usually I end up keeping the can way past its expiration date. And then it's, it's no good once it's expired and you set to throw it away. But yeah. I've seen some beautiful finishes. You can get a, like a, a French polish. I don't know if you're familiar with that using, uh, using shellac and just building up these multiple layers and layers of shellac. It's, it's incredible. But again, it's a real time. Yeah. Consuming process. Well, yeah. And it's people that like to wax their furniture. Um, yeah. after they apply it, like to go with the shellac because shellac is naturally waxy. So it eliminates that step of applying the initial coat of wax because you can just buff the shellac to a very high gloss. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if you're going to use it as that, um, seal coat, um, like Steve does, you really want to go with your de-wax shellac. Um, because other than that, most things will stick on top of it. So, all right, well, either one of you have anything else to say about finishing? Uh, I can't think of anything. You know, I, I think you, it's good to experiment with different finishes and, and see what you like. I think when I first started finishing years and years ago, the kind of the popular finish was polyurethane. And I remember using polyurethane on almost every project and, and then I just realized, wow, this is just taking way too long because it would literally, it could take a week to finish, you know, one project with polyurethane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, any, really any oil base, you know, because it takes, you know, six to eight hours before they even say you can recoat 24 hours um, between, you know, even being able to, to sand it down on slightly, yeah. you know, versus your, your water base is just so quick. You know, it's you're talking about you know just a couple an hour or two hours, uh, depending on you know you, the how hot it is and your humidity. Um, right. You know, so yeah, I'd love using Armor Seal, which is a oil based finish, but like I said, that just the time that goes into it um, is is almost non feasible because once you put that oil-based finish on your project your shop's pretty much unusable um until that finish is completely done and, and yeah, dry exactly any sawdust will fall on it yeah um, which is also something important matter it, no matter what finish you're using i think an important thing they, they never tell you about on the back of the can <laughs> is that before you put on the last coat sand it real lightly or even use steel wool or something to, to knock down all of the little dust particles and anything that's on there. You can feel a finish, and you can just feel the little bumps on there. And all it takes is just a light sanding, then just put on one final coat, and that is a good finish. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, how I do it, especially um, when I shoot my lacquer, I do every, after every two coats, and I usually maybe do about five coats, I will do... Um, I light sanding with 320, and then the, after the final coat is dried, I take a 600 grit um, or even uh, four aught steel wool, and I just that, like you said that light sanding, not not enough to scratch the lacquer and cr- and leave the, uh, the the white scratches in it, but just enough to knock off those nibs um, from all the dirt particles, and yeah, it it leaves a very smooth finish and lacquer. Yeah. Because lacquer burns into itself, you know, right. it doesn't build up. You, yeah. it just it. You you almost start looking like, where is this finish? Like, what what did you put on top of this wood? Just yeah, because it I think just feels half so. Of, half of the success of finishing is how it feels. I mean, how it looks is you know just half the battle. But really, anybody who's going to have that piece of furniture or anything you make is he wants to hold it and touch it and feel it yeah and well i mean that's it, natural that that you know that's just the something that's bred into humans you know you, you yeah. see something that you like you want to feel it you want to touch it 
So, right, and it's disappointing when it feels, you know, plastic or it has those little bumps on it. It just doesn't feel right. It's not that silky yeah. smooth finish. And then you start hating yourself when you got a dust and your little <laughs> dusting rag is getting I was stuck on it. You're like, <laughs> oh man. You know, that brings me back to a pretty pretty epic story I have when I was back in boot camp eleven years ago. Uh it, we our see our company commander. If you had just the the slightest stubble, and he and he hinted, he was like, oh, "Man, I think I think you hadn't shaved." He would make you take a handful of cotton balls and rub them up your face, <laughs> and stick to your face and create a Santa Claus mask. And that just reminds me of like when you're taking like your your little uh, Swiffer wipes or whatever, and you're wiping across that surface that hadn't been denibbed. And all of the little Swiffer starts start sticking to it, that, that <laughs> or, just, the, or the dust on the Swiffer sticks. To yeah, the hips. That, that that makes me that just brings back those times in boot camp, and I, it makes me laugh. And then I'm like, all right, let, let me sand that a little better. One thing people don't always uh, take in consideration too is uh, putting latex enamel paint on a wood surface that you can actually sand that down in between uh, coats as well. Another great suggestion. Absolutely. Yeah, I love sanding paint coats and it really, again, gives you a nice smooth paint layer. Yeah, and you know they recommend sanding paint between coats to give it something to bond to because <laughs> paint, just like poly and any other oil-based finish, it doesn't burn into itself. It sits on top of it. So if there's nothing to bond to between those two layers, eventually, and it may be 50 years down the line, but eventually that that finish is going to fail. Um, so, yeah, I mean, sanding between coats just about on any finishes is worth it. You're going to get a great benefit from it. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, if you guys would like your question answered on air, guaranteed, or you just want to hang out with us after the show because we're pretty awesome, uh, you go over to Patreon and uh, give us a, a small recurring donation. That's www.patreon.com forward slash woodshop101. If a recurring donation is not your suit, um, head over to the website, go to the show notes, and we'll have several links for uh, small one-time donations. Um, anything helps. Uh you know, keep keep the lights on, keep the server costs down, and and just lets us concentrate on delivering great uh, information to you guys, and um, in return, helping find great guest hosts like Steve to uh, come on and kind of share the knowledge that that he's acquired over the years. So, Steve, if you want to give us some contact information in case people want to contact you directly. <laughs> Uh, sure. Anybody can get a hold of me by going to formiermortals.net. It's kind of the hub of all of the ZRAM media operations with Woodworking for Mere Mortals, Home and Garden for Mere Mortals, and Makers Care, which I just recently started, which is actually coming to our first campaign for that. We're raising funds for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. is just ending tomorrow, but we'll be having more fundraisers starting up again. Uh, so, yeah, fourmeremortals.net for all the information. Okay. Very cool. Well, Jeremy, uh, before we sign off, uh, let's go ahead and give our contact information as well. Um, for for myself, you can actually reach me at uh, through my website, which is uh, rhwoodshop.com. And uh, my email is drewshort at rhwoodshop.com. And I'm also very active on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now Periscope if uh, – any of y'all have never done Periscope before, that's that's quite an interesting app to get a hold of. Jeremy, what about yourself, man? Uh, yeah, you can find pretty much any way to contact me at my website, uh, countrysideworkshop.com. Uh, there'll be links there to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I think there's some Pinterest. Um, my email's on there, and I believe a uh, phone number may be on there as well, as well as mailing address if you want to send stuff by snail mail. Um, I'm pretty quick to respond. I typically don't have a life, even though my life is pretty busy. I somehow manage to try to respond to to questions and stuff pretty quickly. So that's right. uh, that's where you can contact me. Well, if you also want to get a hold of just Jeremy and myself at the same time through Woodshop 101, you can find us on uh, iTunes, YouTube, as well as our woodshop101podcast.com slash listen website. Uh, there you can stream uh, episodes 
through any mobile devices as well as your computer. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to help our show get into the public eye. And also, this will help with sponsorships in the near future. Uh, also, if you have a question that you uh, want answered on air, you can email us at woodshop101podcast at gmail.com or you can leave us a voicemail on our brand new number, which is uh, 409 234 3959. You do not need a computer for that. You can just call on any phone. Uh, we post new episodes of the show every two weeks, or we hope to. <laughs> and we hope to hear from you guys soon with those questions. And if you have any show suggestions, go to our Facebook pages and uh, send us some comments. We'd love to uh, get some more suggestions for shows in the future. So from Jeremy, myself, and our special guest, Steve Ramsey, we want to wish you guys well and to be safe in your shops. And Steve, I know you're familiar with my sign-off that I do on my show. We've kind of adopted that into this show. So just from the three of us, let's give everybody a boom. One, two, three. Boom. Boom.